All right, hey everyone. So I tried to uh, use the sample midterm, you know, this thing, uh, to just make a bunch of similar questions. That way we could uh, get a bit more practice. And I got pretty lazy when it came to making the graph, so I pulled it from some other university where it was Math 124. It's like, you can ignore all this stuff. And there are a few other things that I'm not gonna worry about. It's like this, we're not gonna worry about. Um, there are a few other things I'm gonna scratch out. Uh, this, for example, not really need to worry about. Um, but let's just let's just run through this. So, all right, the limit as x goes to 4 of f of x. Well, hey, as x goes to 4, uh, I can't tell you which y value I'm going to. Because if I'm walking this way, it looks like I'm going to, I don't know, like maybe 7. But if I'm walking this way, it looks like I'm going to, I don't know, like 9.5 or something like that. Right? So um, this limit does not exist. I cannot tell you one single spot that I'm going to. All right, how about 7 from the right? So... Here's seven. If I'm approaching from the right, that means I'm doing this and following my graph, and oh my goodness, I go up forever. That's called infinity. All right, how about the slope at zero? The slope at zero. Oh, hey, look at this. Oh my goodness, it lies on a line. And here's another spot on my line. I went over three, I went up five. So the slope is rise over run. This is five thirds. All right, the limit as x goes to negative three. Let's take a peek. x goes to negative three. I guess I'm going to get closer to there, which is negative five. All right. Negative five. We're not worrying about this one. Here we are, and okay, now the reason I didn't cross this out is because there was something like this on the last one, but instead of a five, the last time we had this, right? There was whatever number was there would appear there. So if f of three is five, this is actually something we've seen before. So let's check. f of three is five. Yes, we've seen it before. Okay, so what is this expression? Well, if we look over here, Whoop. It's the derivative, right? This is a 3, this is a 3, this is a 3. So that's what's going on. Oop. So this is the derivative at 3. Derivative at 3. Well, at 3, if I'm standing here and someone said, what's the slope underneath your feet? I would say it's 5 thirds, okay? So this is 5 thirds. How about the slope at 5? Let's take a peek. Slope at 5. Oh, it looks like I'm at the peak up here. This is a slope zero. If I was standing there, if I was really, really tiny, if I could zoom in as much as I want, that'd be slope zero, okay? Zero. All right. Uh, now, this is something more complicated than what we've seen before because we have this plus sign here. Um, I'll briefly just kind of talk about it anyway. This is talking about slope at negative eight. Okay, so slope at negative eight. And notice the slope at negative eight it's actually like a positive infinity or something like that. But if I was, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, is it negative eight? Yeah, it is negative eight. The answer is positive infinity. But again, this is not really something we've seen. Don't worry about it. All right, we have seen this. Uh, right, this plus symbol is what made it different, but whatever. Uh, so we're looking at f prime of minus six. And let's take a peek. Oh, look at that. We're at the top of a hill. That's a horizontal tangent line. That's a slope of zero. Uh, this is zero. All right, yet again, I really hope that even though they wrote plus five, this is minus f of minus three, okay? Which actually, you know, I bet this one that I crossed out, I bet, I bet, I bet that this is actually um, minus f of minus eight, like all of that up top, okay? And I bet that this right here is zero. Let's take a peek. f of minus eight, f of minus eight. Oh, f of minus eight is not zero. Um, and you might say, well, it looks like it's zero to me. I would say no. I think right here is when we touch minus eight, and right here looks like I'm a little bit to the right. So I'm going to continue to to skip this guy. I don't like it. Okay. But here, f of minus three is minus five. f of minus three is minus five. Okay. So f of minus three is minus five, and notice if you did minus f of negative three, you'd get a plus five. So this is actually just the derivative at minus three. This is much trickier than what we'd have you do, but we can still talk about it. And the derivative at minus three, there's no well-defined slope on a corner. So it doesn't exist. Uh, does not exist. All right, list all the intervals where the derivative is negative. That means f of x is decreasing. This is what we're going to look for. And when we talk about decreasing, we mean moving from left to right. So let's see, I decrease here and I decrease 
here and I decrease here. So what are these intervals? Well, from negative six to negative three, okay, negative six, negative three, and I'm not gonna touch either of them because at negative six, I'm not decreasing or increasing. I'm just sort of like teeter-tottering up top, okay? And at negative three, I'm not decreasing or increasing. It's just kind of teeter-tottering too. All right, same thing, positive five to seven, but I don't touch either of them. So uh, union, positive five to seven. And again, this is all much harder than you'd be expected to do, okay? But we're just gonna do it to review some concepts because we have seen these concepts. Uh, union, and then seven to, I don't know, maybe this is, uh, we'll call it eight. So seven to eight, boom. So we're decreasing on all of these three intervals, okay? All right, what about where's the derivative decreasing? This means f double prime of x had better be negative, which means the original function had better be concave down. So we're gonna look for places where concave down, okay? Let's see. And I'm getting increasingly lazy. I don't really wanna do the whole thing. So look, you're concave down here. So the interval from negative eight to negative three. You're concave down here. So that's positive four to positive seven. And that's it. So those are the two intervals for this question. Uh, let's hop over to this question. A critical value for f is any spot where f prime is zero or undefined. List all the critical values. So we just wanna find all the spots where the derivative is zero or undefined. Let's mark them in red. The derivative is zero at negative six. The derivative is undefined at negative three. The derivative is undefined at positive four. The derivative is zero at positive five. The derivative is zero at positive eight. And the derivative is undefined at seven because we have this vertical asymptote here. I think I got every, oh, nope, there's one more spot. Tricky, tricky, tricky. The derivative is undefined at negative eight. Um, if you were to look at f prime of negative eight, it would be infinity, which is actually undefined. It's like one over x if x was zero, uh, or you know, like one over x squared. Uh, you, you can't actually plug it in. We can talk about things blowing up. And so you should really read this as the slope blows up at negative eight, but it's not a number, it's just an idea. It's this idea of being infinitely steep, okay? Whew, all right, lots of derivative practice. So if you have to compute the derivative, uh, write as many things as you can with a power. All right, so let's write everything we can with an exponent. So one over x is actually x to the negative one, and one over x squared is x to the negative two, and then I have x squared plus x. So I'm not taking a derivative yet, even though I'm supposed to compute the derivative. I just rewrote it. Now let's compute the derivative. So a prime of x, I want to take the derivative of the top. That's negative 1, x to the negative 2, plus negative 2, x to the negative 3. So there's the derivative of the top. I multiply it by the bottom, x squared plus x. And then I take the derivative of the bottom, so I'm going to subtract derivative of the bottom, 2x plus 1, times the top. x to the minus 1 plus x to the minus 2, boom all over the bottom squared, x squared plus x squared. This is a prime of x, and I leave it alone. I don't simplify it. This is super easy to grade, and it's the derivative. All right, here I have a function inside a function. Uh, so let's begin, b prime of x. I take the derivative of the outside, so that looks like this. I leave the inside alone, 7x plus square root x squared plus 3. Then I take the derivative of the inside, Derivative of 7x is 7 plus, oh my goodness, derivative of this, I take the, all right, maybe I should have written this thing as x squared plus 3 to the 1 half power. So I take the derivative of the inside, sorry, I take the derivative of the outside, leave the inside alone. So let's leave the inside alone, x squared plus 3, times the derivative of the inside, which is a 2x, okay? All right, here it is. There's the derivative. Log base 5, if you watched the last video, you know the derivative is 1 over the natural log of 5 times 1 over, and then all this stuff, 3x squared plus 4. So that's the derivative of the log part, leaving the inside alone. Now I do the derivative of the inside. So that 2 comes down, I get 6x plus 4. Boom. So again, it's just chain rule, and we're done. Leave it alone. All right, there it is. Uh, ideally, we should probably also label it at c prime of x, but whatever. Hey, log of base three. Okay, let's do this. So we need to do the quotient rule. And here we go, derivative of the top. That's one over the natural log of three times one over x. 
Okay, so derivative of the top times the bottom, so times sine of x, minus the derivative of the bottom, cosine of x, times the top, log base 3 of x, all over the bottom squared, which we'll often write like sine squared of x. Anyway, sorry my penmanship got so bad there, but there it is. All right, another derivative, g prime of x. I take the derivative of the outside, and I leave the inside alone. So that's log base 4 of 5 times, oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Oh my goodness, I've just tricked myself. I've just tricked myself because I was going so quickly. Look, this is, this is a function of x. Here there's no x's. In fact, this is just a number. It would be like saying g of x is equal to 3. What's the derivative? Well, g prime of x is 0. It's 0. We're done. Okay, don't worry about it. I don't care how complicated this is. It's a number. There's no x's. It's a number. The derivative number is 0. Whew. All right. Here there's x's. All right, here we go. So power rule, that pi comes down, pi minus 1. Leave the inside alone. Times, now I need to take the derivative of the inside. That's a product rule, because there's a product. Derivative of the first times the second, plus the derivative of the second times the first. There it is. There's my derivative. Oh my goodness, so many of these. Okay, uh, I really want to think of this as a one-half power, and here I have 5 to the x plus e to the sine x. Oh my goodness, I'll just... <sighs> Sorry, I've been doing... I did these videos back to back. I'm going to write s for sine, so s of x. Okay, great. Let's figure out the derivative of j. So 1 half comes down, leave the inside alone, minus 1 half times, and I'll have to do the derivative of the inside. That's going to be natural log 5, 5 to the x plus e to the sine x times cosine x. All of this, all of that, was the derivative of the inside. 5 to the x plus e to the sine x. And here I left it blank. This is when I leave the inside alone. e to the sine x. Okay. So this is my answer. And that nasty piece is the derivative of the inside. All right. All right, here. M is just a number. We're told k is a function of x, and so we just think m is a number, okay? Don't let it trick you. This is a number times x squared, so the 2 comes down. I have 2 times that number times x, plus here that's gone. That's just the 3, and here that's dead. That would become a plus 0, or you just don't write anything. So there's the answer. All right, one more. Uh, so, all right, this is really a 1 half power, right, instead of a square root. Uh, so what do we do? Take the derivative of the outside, leave the inside alone, times the derivative of the inside is natural log 5, 5x plus n prime of x. Though this is the derivative of the inside stuff, and previously you left it alone, because that's how the chain rule do, baby. Local linearization, you should think of tangent line. And terrible penmanship. Okay, so... Um, We've got a point and we've got a slope. Let's draw a line. So the point is one comma two. That's right here. The slope is negative one. Oh my goodness, pray for me. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, that works. Okay, cool. So this is my local linearization and I'm calling it L of X, sweet. Let's draw it, I did it. All right, now we've got a few options here. So we could be concave up, we could be concave down or whatever the heck this is. So let's go ahead and draw them. So the first thing I draw, I'm gonna call it F1. I'm concave up, and I need to be tangent at this point. So I'm gonna be tangent at this point and move away, and I'm calling this F1 of X. So let me just show you the problem really quick. <clears throat> All right, so here's some stuff we know about F of X, but I'm not telling you what F of X is, okay? And what this means is, since we know a point, we know a slope at the point, we can draw a tangent line. So that's what L of X is. What a tangent line is, is the line that your curve looks like if you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in on the spot of tangency. In that little region, the blue curve and the green curve look the same. Okay, That's a tangent line. And then the reason F1 of x is concave up is because I'm told the second derivative at 1 is positive. So that means when I'm near x equals 1, I had better have a concave up shape, okay? It doesn't matter what happens away from f of 1. I could have drawn f of x, or sorry, f1 of x as being concave down, and then I come in like this, and then I can be concave up, okay? 
This is a totally valid f1 of x, even though it's not always concave up. What matters is that locally, at x equals 1, this area is concave up. We have this kind of shape locally, OK? Anyway, so there we are. That's f1. What if we did concave down? Concave down. All right, same idea. I'm going to come in. I want to think concave down thoughts. Think concave down thoughts. Think tangency thoughts. Think tangency thoughts. And back to concave down. This is f2 of x. And again, right, in this region, they all look the same because they all have the same tangent line, which means they all look the same when you zoom in, and they look like that line. All right, but now we're finally concave down. Concave down. And, uh, oh, there's some other stuff I asked for. So if we look at 1.1, notice, so here's the value 1. So 1.1 is like this. So 1.1 is a, uh, on F2, F2 of 1.1 is less or equal to L of 1.1, which is, let me move this over a little. Whoa, mm, that doesn't look so good. Let's do, I'll put it down here, great. Which is less or equal to, whoop, here's f1 of 1.1, and then this other dot is, right, so all of these dots are at x equals 1.1, it's just a matter of which curve you're on. And sort of the concave up stuff is above, the concave down stuff is below. And, ugh f1 of 1.1. This is all very reminiscent of question 3 on the sample exam. So I said, uh, suppose you're concave up, draw a possible f of x, label it, and then how does L of 1.1 compare? Is it an overestimate, underestimate, or spot on, right? And so uh, when we're concave up, we're an overestimate. When we're concave down, we're an underestimate. That's not always true. It'll depend on your slope and some other things. So I'm really looking at this picture to answer this question, okay? And uh, if you don't have concavity at one, there's a few options. Sorry, sorry for all the zooming stuff. Uh, you could you could honestly just say like, well, hey, uh, I'm gonna let this be f3 of x, okay? So I'm labeling f3 of x as the thing which has second derivative zero at one, and lines will do that. This is one totally valid option. You could also give yourself a point of inflection. I could like come in, concave down, look like the line, leave concave up. That also works, right? Just notice the fact that everything bunches up right here is because everything, they all have the same tangent line. And that doesn't actually make sense unless I talk about where your tangent, so tangent line at x equals one, okay? Which means if I zoom in, they all will look the same. And actually, god damn it, I just I wanna I wanna show you this phenomenon. I love it too much. Okay, this is the heart of Calc 1, in my opinion. So let's pop over to a Desmos. Uh, you, I, I thought for sure it'd be like one of my common pages by now. Boom. Let's go here. And let's just let's look at the line y equals x. Okay. But now let's look at sine of x. All right, and notice if I zoom in, oh, God damn it. Ugh. If I zoom in, zoom in, they look the same, right? The more I zoom in, the more the same they look until you cannot tell the difference. Uh, let me do another one. Let's do uh, e to the x minus one. Oh, there it is. There's that green curve. So I, I guess I have to zoom in a little bit more. Fine, let's zoom in a little bit more. And now they all look the same. If I take away the green curve, it looks blue. If I take away the blue curve, it looks red. Take the red curve, oh, it's all gone. Okay, here's, oh, let's just cover it up, you know. So um, what else can we do? Uh, let's see, we could take natural log of x, uh, which if I want to, we should move it over by one. And, um, oh, God, so this, it's going to be zero when, so let's see, when x is two, oh, 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 oh. Sorry, I wanted to plus one. Ah, there it is. Great. And now, look, let's go back home. Boom. There's all these different curves. All these different curves, but they all have the same tangent line at x equals zero. And so they all look the same as you zoom in. And I like to call this the flat earth phenomenon, right? Curvy things look flat when you zoom in. The tangent line 
is the line that you look like when you zoom in. So anyway, that's what's going on here. Okay? All these things look the same when I zoom in. And what changes is like concave up, concave down, stuff like that. Okay? All right, so that's that question. Stability theorem. All right, I actually kind of regret uh, this one, so I'm just going to not do it. It's just too gross, and we're not going to give you gross stuff on the exam. Uh, so let's do this. So uh, I didn't say this, but we should really find and classify all the equilibrium points. Let's find these equilibrium points. An equilibrium is when what you put in is what you get out. In other words, let's give a name to what I put in. Maybe I put in x. So if I put in x, then I would compute x minus 0.5x over 1 plus 0.1x plus 1. That's my computation. I input x, and I do this computation. And apparently, it's the same as what I get out, which is x. This is how you find equilibrium. You have to solve this type of equation. Okay? Uh, we commonly abbreviate this as x equals f of x, where we're not saying the function is x. We're saying that there's a special spot. So maybe I should say star. x star equals f of x star. There's a special spot where it's true. Okay? All right, so now we have to solve this, which looks kind of gross, but you could subtract x from both sides, and then these are gone. And then if I move this thing over, I'll have 0.5x over 1 plus 0.1x is equal to 1. And if I multiply both sides by the denominator, then I have 1 half x is equal to 1 plus a tenth x. And if I subtract 1 tenth x from both sides, I get 0.4x is equal to 1. And so then I find out x is equal to 1 over 0.4, better known as 5 halves, better known as 2.5. Sweet. So there is my equilibrium point. And we often actually call it x star, or really we'd probably call it c star in this case because we're using c for these variables. Whatever. It's this number. If you plug it in, you, it'll be what you get out. Okay, that's what's special about an equilibrium point. All right, so c star is 2.5. c star is 2.5. Great. Now, I take my updating function, and I'm going to write it involving x. So this is x minus 0.5x over 1 plus 0.1x plus 1. Ugh. And now let's take a derivative. f prime of x is derivative of u, 1, minus. Derivative of this, ah, uh, we have to use a quotient rule. Derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top all over the bottom squared. And the derivative of 1 is 0, so just don't worry about it. All right, here's my derivative. Now I have to plug in 2 and a half, 1 minus 0.5 times. And 2 and a half uh, times 0.1 times 0.1 is 0.25. So this right here is 1.25, 1.25 minus, and uh, here we have 0.1 times half of that. This is 1.25. Okay, fine. And this is all over uh, 1.25 squared. Fine, whatever. Uh, let's do some more algebra stuff. Whew. All right. So, hey, look, here's a 1.25, here's a 1.25, and here it's squared. So you could factor it on top and cancel. And then what's left over is 1 minus, and then 0.5 minus 0.1 is 0.4, divided by this thing, 1.25. 1 minus some number that's less than 1. This is just something that's less than 1, okay? And, and I do mean in absolute value here. Throw so absolute values all around. You get an absolute value. You get an absolute value. Okay, whatever. This number, if here's 0 and here's 1, it lies somewhere in here. Okay? Which means the C star equals 2.5 is stable. Because the absolute value of the derivative is less than 1. Okay? As long as you lie somewhere in this window between negative 1 and 1, uh, and by u lie, what I mean is, as long as the derivative lies between that, as long as the slope is between plus or minus 1, then the point is stable. All right, let's do it again. So first we need to find the equilibrium values. So I'm looking at x equals x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x. Let's figure out when this is true. So I'm going to move the x over. I get x cubed 
uh, minus 3x squared plus 2x is equal to 0. So let's factor. This is x squared minus 3x plus 2. And that further factors as x minus 1 and x minus 2. All right, so we have three equilibrium points. We have, sorry, this is x star. We have 0, 1, and 2. All right, let's take a derivative to figure out whether or not these things are going to be stable or what. Uh, so we have 3x squared minus 6x plus 3. And if we plug in 0 in absolute value, we have 0, 0, 3. We have 3. That's bigger than 1. We are now unstable. Okay, if we plug in 1 in absolute value, we have 3 minus 6 plus 3. That's 0. That's less than 1. This is stable. And if we plug in 2, that's 12 minus 12 plus 3. You get 3. That's bigger than 1. That's unstable. All right, cool. All right, last one. Oh, let's find the equilibrium points. So we're looking at y star is equal to 2y star over 1 plus 0 0.001 y star. Great. Let's multiply that denominator over. So we have y star times 1 is just itself times this other thing is 0 0.001 y star squared is equal to 2y star. Okay, let's get all the y's on the same side. So I'm going to subtract the 2y star. And I get, I'm going to put the quadratic term first, 0 0.001 y star squared. And then minus y star, because I moved over 2 and I only had 1, is equal to 0. And now we're going to factor this. So we have y star, and then 0 0.001 y star minus 1 is equal to 0. We find out there's two equilibrium points. You could be 0. Right there, we kill everything. Or you could be a thousand. If you plug that in here, you'll get one minus one, you kill everything. All right, so these are two equilibrium points. Let's take our updating function, which is 2x over 1 plus 0.001x. Let's find its derivative, f prime of x, derivative of the top times the bottom, 0.001x minus derivative of the bottom, 001 times the top, 2x all over the bottom squared, 1 plus 0.001x squared. Whew. All right, we need to plug in 0. If we plug in 0, then you're gone and you're gone. So up top, I have a 2. And on bottom, I have a 1. That's So in absolute value, this is bigger than 1. That's unstable. All right, let's look at f prime of 1,000. Now, plugging in 1,000, this product here would be a 1. So 1 plus 1, uh, 2 times 1 plus 1 is 4, minus. And then here we'd have a 2 over, and then here we'd have a 2 squared is 4, better known as 2 fourths, better known as 1 half, which in absolute value is still less than 1, so we're stable. All right, moving on, extrema of a function. All right, if we're given a derivative, whoop, and yet we're asked to talk about the original function, which we're not given, well, we can still do the first derivative test. So what do we do? We make a number line, and we tick off all the spots where f prime of x is 0 or undefined. Here's f prime. It's defined everywhere, but where is it 0? Well, if I plug in 0, that would kill everything. So if I plug in 0, that would kill everything. If I plug in negative 2, that would also kill everything. So here's negative 2. And if I plug in positive 2, that would also kill everything. All right. So now I want to check the sign of the derivative on uh, these intervals. So stuff less than 2, stuff, sorry, stuff less than negative 2. Stuff between negative 2 and 0, stuff between 0 and 2, and stuff that's bigger than 2. So imagine plugging in some x number, which is less than negative 2. All right, if you plug it in, then this number here is negative. So I'd have a negative times. What about this number, x plus 2? That would also be negative. Then plug in negative 3. It's, it's negative 1. You're good in negative. And what about this number, x minus 2? Well, that's also negative, times a negative. So we have a negative times a negative times a negative. That means we have a negative here, which means our original function, our f of x, is going to be decreasing. Whew, okay. What about in this area? Let's plug in negative 1, okay? If you plug in negative 1, 
you'll get a negative. Here you'll get a positive. And here you'll get a negative. So I have negative times a positive times a negative. That's a positive, which means you're going uphill. This is a minimum. Let's plug in positive one. If I plug in positive one, that's a positive. Plug in positive one, mm, that's a positive. Plug in positive one, oh no, that's a negative. Positive times a positive times a negative, that's a negative, we're going downhill. What about something bigger than two? Well, this will be positive, this will be positive, and this will be positive, you'll be positive, you go back uphill, you got a minimum. And here you got a maximum. Congrats, we're done, we're done. Okay, if we're given the original function, we have to first find its derivative. Let's do that. Minus 3x squared plus 6x, and the minus 4 is dead. And now we need to figure out, when is this equal to 0? Okay, so let's figure that out. So 0 is equal to, let's just factor out that negative 3x, and we're left with x minus 2. And so now we find out that when x is 0, the derivative is 0, and when x is 2, the derivative is 0. All right, let's plug in something over here. If I plug in negative 1, then I'd have a positive, because this product would be positive, and I'd have a negative. And a positive times a negative is negative. So we're talking about f prime, and here we're talking about f. f is going downhill. All right, let's plug in positive 1. If I plug in positive 1, then this is negative, and this is also negative. Negative and negative, positive, we're going uphill. Let's plug in 47. If I plug in 47, this is negative, this is positive. Overall, it's a negative. We're going back downhill. Here we have a max, and here we have a min. Great. Oh, local extrema, here's this thing. Great, let's do it. All right, first let's find the derivative, just like before. But oh my goodness, we have to do a product rule. Derivative of the first is 2t times the second, so that's 10 minus t to the 2 thirds, plus the derivative of the second times the first. I'm just going to leave the first alone. Derivative of the second, you get 2 thirds minus 1 third. Leave the inside alone. Then the derivative of the inside is minus 1. Cool. We need to figure out when that's 0. So 0 is equal to, and here we have a 2t, 10 minus t to the 2 thirds, plus, actually let's make that minus because of this guy here, and then we have 2t squared over 3. Uh, do I want, sorry, this should be a 3. This should be 1 third. 10 minus t to the 1 third. Okay, rewriting exponents so that way they're positive helps my brain know what's going on because now I know this is in the denominator. All right, we want to solve when this is 0. So let's go ahead and just like uh, move this thing over to that side, right? We'll add it to both sides. And so if you did that, then it looks like this. Okay, okay well, now let's go ahead and just uh, multiply the denominator over. So if I just multiply this guy over here, then that combines with that, and we find out that 2t squared is equal to, let's see, that's 6. Um, actually, I just want to kill these two. Let's just divide them away. Let's just get rid of them. Let's make our lives easier. So those twos are gone. We got a 3 and then 10 minus t, because a 1 third plus a 2 thirds is a 3 thirds, better known as 1. Oh, okay, almost done, almost done. So, um, now this is what we're trying to solve, which looks much nicer, and we have t squared is equal to 30 minus 3t, and let's move everything to one side. So, this is actually t squared, plus 3t minus 30 is equal to 0. Does that factor nicely? 30, we got 5 and 7. No, not 5. Sorry. 5 and 6. We got 10 and 3. We got 2 and 15. I don't think it's going to factor too nice. So let's do the quadratic formula. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. So 4ac is going to be plus 120 over 2a2. Two. All right, so we have two um, critical points, critical numbers, sorry. One of them is when we take the minus sign. So it's a negative number. It's minus 3 minus the square root of 129 all over 2. And then the other one 
is minus 3 plus the square root of 129 all over 2. All right, and then we want to talk about f prime on the in-between regions. Sorry, a prime, I suppose. And a prime, let's remind ourselves what that looks like. It looks like 2t, 10 minus t to the 2 thirds. And then we have a minus, minus uh, t squared. We've got 2t squared over 3, 10 minus t is the 1 third. OK. Oh, and you know what? There's something else we should catch real quick, which is a prime of t is undefined at t equals 10. If I plug this in, we have denominator of 0. It's undefined. OK, well, the square root of 121 is 11. This is going to be a little bit bigger than 11, which means that overall this is roughly about 4. So 10 is going to be over here. So I need to add that to my number line. Okay. Going to add it. Here's 10. Okay. okay, so let's see. This is about 4. This is about uh, negative 3. Minus 11 is negative 14. Over 2 is negative 7. That's about negative 7 and about positive 4. Okay, so let's see. If we plug in 0 for t, then this whole thing is 0. This is Oh, shoot, did I miss? Did I ever divide by a t? What the heck happened? 2t, blah -de blah t, this thing, that thing. I moved over. I'm trying to find this is 0. And t equals 0 works. Did I ever do I make an algebra? Here's a 2t. 3t, it should be t squared, okay, yeah. Oh, did I lose a t? I did. Oh, man, that sucks. I lost the t. This should have been a 3t. The 2's canceled, this 2 and that 2, but I have a t here, and I have a 3 here, and then these two things combine to get me this. All right, all right. Oh, that's actually, that's probably better news. It means my numbers are probably going to be nicer. All right, so... New plan. This is 30t minus 3t squared. All right, let's put everything over on the left-hand side. So we got plus 3t is 4t squared minus 30t equals 0. Oh, much better. We can factor this. Let's just pull out 2t. We're left with 2t minus 15 equals 0. So we get t equals 0 or 15 divided by 2. Much better. All right, I'm still working on number 3. So we got 0, we got 15 over 2. And let's remind ourselves that a prime of t is... <coughs> a cough. Uh, a prime of t is 2t, 10 minus t, to the 2 thirds, minus 2t squared over 3... 10 minus t to the one third. Okay. Sweet. All right, so 15 over 2, this is 7 and a half. Uh, let's plug in some other number, maybe like 5 or something. What happens if we plug in 5? Let's see, this is 10, this is some other positive number. This whole thing is positive. Um, this will also be positive. Oh, that doesn't really help. We have to check. You know, let's just go and graph it. Let's just treat ourselves. So let's graph um, f of x is equal to. And then it was 2x. Oh, I have to double check this thing. Boom. This thing. I've got 2x, 10 minus x to the 2 third. Oh my goodness, what? What? 10 minus x to the 2 thirds. Great. Minus, we need a fraction, 2x squared over. 3, 10 minus x to the 1 third. Great. All right. So here we are, and we have our two equilibrium values, or not equal, ugh, our two critical numbers are when the derivative is 0. It's 
So I have the derivative graphed, and it's 0 at x equals 7.5 and x equals 0. And in between those two spots, the derivative, which is the thing that's graphed, is positive, right? I'm like, I'm up here. I'm in the positives. So in between these two spots, the derivative is positive. And over here was negative, and over here was negative, which means I go up here, I go down here, and I go down here. This is a max. This is a min. Okay? Oh, so that was problem three. Gross. Fine. Whatever. Let's do problem four. So problem four, much easier in some sense. We have our critical numbers, seven and a half and zero. And then we have our endpoints, negative four and five. We want to look at our critical numbers and endpoints, but just the critical numbers inside of this interval. So minus four, that's going to matter. We're going to have to plug that into our function. Zero, that's going to matter because zero is inside of this interval. And 5, that's going to matter. But 7.5 doesn't matter. It's not inside of our interval. So we just take each of these, and one by one, we plug them in and see what we get. Well, if I plug in 0, I get 0. I can really quickly see that because of this t squared. OK, fine. Um, if I plug in negative 4, I'll have 16 times, and this will be 14 to the 2 thirds. Fine. If I plug in 5, I will have 25. And this will be 5 to the 2 thirds. OK, so it's just a competition between these two numbers on who's bigger. And let's see, the cube root, I'm going to square this. So what are we looking at here? Um, is there any tricks I can do to really break this up? No, not really. So you should just see who's bigger. This thing here is definitely the absolute min. And then whichever of these two is bigger is the winner for the absolute maximum. I have a hunch that it's this one, but I really don't know. You should just plug them in and see. And that's where I'm gonna end this video.